we actually get started with a workshop in itself and I will introduce the reasons why we have chosen this topic and also the agenda, what is going to wait us ahead. Let me just briefly introduce uh, our own team who has been behind organizing this workshop. My name is uh, René Dönissam. I come from Estonia and uh, I'm working as a semantic expert for SME competitiveness at the Interreg Europe uh, policy learning platform. And I will be the host today together with my colleagues Lux Merber from Germany and Mart Wellister also from Estonia. At the same time, we also have uh, colleagues Ann and Eugenie from our communication team here uh, who will help you and us uh, with the technical aspects. They are available throughout the whole event uh, by, via chat uh, and uh, will be ready to help in case of any technical problems. I see that the number of uh, participants is increasing and uh, I see also that uh, we have all the speakers here. So uh, with your kind permission, then uh, let me make some introductory words and justifications why we have chosen uh, this workshop and how it will be uh, structured today. Uh, it is relatively common knowledge that uh, scale-up companies are important cornerstones for economic growth in uh, different regions and countries. And uh, they also contribute strongly to fostering innovation in Europe. However, it is perhaps less talked about uh, that uh, scaling up business activities is not always easy for European SMEs. And indeed, that is the very reason why we have chosen this topic of the workshop in order to understand what are the main challenges in scale-up process and what type of support can be provided to the European SMEs on regional, national and European level in order to help the entrepreneurs to succeed in scale-up activities and uh, go from local markets to European, international and global markets, what uh, at the end of the day, scaling up stands for and means. Concerning the workshop agenda today, then uh, in a few minutes, uh, we will start with the first plenary session of the workshop. And uh, there we have uh, three confirmed uh, exciting keynote speakers sharing their experience in how to successfully uh, support SMEs in this particular sector to scale up. Uh, after the plenary session, we will break into two breakout sessions, which will take place in parallel. Uh, you will be automatically transferred to those sessions based on your earlier registration, so you have no worries in, uh, in technical terms that you, have, you would have to push or choose something. So working group number one will focus on uh, scale-up support programs and financing. And the so working group number two will focus on uh, benchmarking internationalization approaches for scaling up. Both working groups will have uh, three presentations based on Interreg Europe good practices. After it, after all those presentations in both uh, parallel groups, we will have uh, discussions who will interfere and uh, will summarize as uh, presentations as well as lead discussions uh, for the remaining part of the parallel session. Uh, the discussions will of course be open uh, to all uh, participants uh, in terms of asking questions or making relevant contributions. After the parallel sessions, we will have a short break uh, in order to relax a bit and allow also the uh, discussions to prepare some of the feedback notes uh, to be presented. And then uh, we will continue with another plenary, which uh, then uh, first starts with summaries from parallel sessions and will finish then by another keynote speaker from European Commission who is introducing us the possibilities, what's a new single market program 
is going to offer to European SMEs interested to scale up their businesses. During the entire workshop, there will be time for questions after every presentation, but we do encourage you to submit the questions anytime online in advance. Uh, if we cannot answer all questions which we have received during the meeting, we will come back to them by email after the workshop. After the official end of the workshop, we have also created the possibility for online expert help desk. Uh, this will be offered to those who are interested to find out more about what Interreg Europe policy learning platform can offer and which type of services are available there for different European regions and uh, stakeholders. Having said that, I do hope very much that this workshop will provide you with new insights and ideas how to support scale-up activities in your regions and countries. And let me wish you all a very fruitful and interesting discussion. And now I would like to invite our first speaker, uh, Laurencio David, who is representing Joint Tech Tech Secretariat of Interreg Europe a program to share with us uh, some ideas what is going to happen with Interreg Europe program in future, as well as what is the current status quo. So, Lorenzo, when you are ready, you are most welcome. Share your screen, and we are delighted to learn more about Interreg Europe. Thanks a lot, Rene. Thanks a lot also to the old the other colleagues from the policy learning platform who are uh, involved in organizing this, uh, this event. Unfortunately, still online. Uh, and to all participants, greetings also on behalf of the, of the program. Uh, I am Laurenti David, together with my colleague Laria, we have the true pleasure of monitoring uh, your projects on the topic of SME competitiveness. And we are perfectly aware that uh, today's session is about content. It's, well, uh, it's very thematic, but before diving in, uh, also on behalf of the program, would uh, like to give you an update on where we are with the program and where we are heading with uh, the program. Of course, uh, there will be still a bit of secrecy. We will not uh, tell you all about the future. <laughs> partly because we are still preparing it, but still uh, at least to give you some uh, some hints of uh, where we are um, heading. So I will try to share my screen now. I would just like to have confirmation from one of you that uh, this is fine, okay? It's all fine, Laurencio, please go ahead. Thanks a lot. Um, so yes, uh, as most of you are, um, are uh, project partners or uh, stakeholders or in any uh, way, uh, members of, uh, of our interregional community, uh, there is no need to insist so much on what is our program, of course, the program about improving policies. We have a strong focus on structural funds. We have a mix of more uh, and less advanced region and the high participation of peripheral regions. Uh, the topic um, that we are financing programs in this uh, project in this uh, programming period are four of them. You can uh, see them listed on the right uh, head side of the slide. And of course, this, uh, this workshop is dedicated to the second thematic objective, which is SMB competitive. Um, we had four call of proposals, uh, and we are currently financing 258 projects. Of course, some of you may argue that actually we have a fifth call that was recently closed. It was a very successful fifth call, but this one, this call was still restricted only to the projects coming from the previous four, uh, four calls. So if you look at the bigger picture, uh, it's still uh, more or less uh, 260 projects. Now, if you are 
looking only at the uh, projects covering SME competitiveness, uh, we have 66 of them, so almost a perfect quarter of uh, projects that uh, Interreg Europe uh, finances. As, as you can see on the slide, we are covering almost everything that uh, there is to cover um, in terms of uh, topics. And thank you, thank you, uh, thanks to your project partners. We have a rich, very rich library of good practices on all the fields listed um, on this slide. And talking about good practices, um, here there are some figures about the current level of uh, outputs achieved by a program. I'm not talking yet about the results achieved, only about the outputs that lead to those results. And we are proud that we have more than 4,000 good practices identified and shared uh, on the good practices database and on your uh, project website. We already uh, approved 115 pilot action, which is, uh, for me, it's unbelievable still that uh, uh, so many of the projects led into this uh, practical element of testing what was learned. We have almost 1,000 uh, action plans validated, and in terms of uh, staff with increased capacity, we have exceeded by far the target uh, that we have uh, in the cooperation program. So the target that we initially set for Interreg Europe, and just to tell you, this is just with uh, 196 projects that closed phase one. So we are not counting the remaining, even almost 100 is still uh, need to uh, produce this uh, and similar uh, outputs. Now, in terms of results, uh, we are always comparing the amount of funds that was infused in our projects and the amount of funds that were influenced uh, as uh, an effect of the policy learning, of the implementation of the pilot action, of the implementation of the action plans. And we, as you can see uh, here, um, we have uh, exceeded 1 billion euro of uh, fund influence and the leverage effect is uh, almost at six. And uh, this, is, this is indeed very encouraging and we would like to thank you for your efforts in uh, achieving this and uh, in reporting it to us. Because this also helps us uh, prove uh, the political dissidents that Interreg Europe is an effective program, is a, uh, an official program that needs to be continued in this uh, period. Now, if we are going towards the, we used to call it next programming period, but actually the current programming period already now, so the 21-27, you will see that there will be no revolution in the way our program works, but there is a, an evolution. And this is mainly uh, based on the recent development at European level, but also on, uh, based on the lessons learned from the implementation of the current program. So unfortunately, we will have one country less than uh, in the previous uh, program, but we will have a similar overall objective, almost similar budget, and the policymakers will still be the core target group of um, our projects and activities at program level. Of course, you will have a similar means to achieve uh, the objectives that you are setting by participating in our program, meaning classical exchange of experience activities, pilot actions uh, when justified, and uh, of course, action planning and uh, achievement of policy changes. What I think it comes with a good news is that the focus on structural funds will be lightened, meaning that in the 2014-2020, we had uh, at least 50% uh, of uh, the policy instrument needed to be structural funds. In the future program, only one of the policy instruments that you are targeting must be a structural fund. And also, we are planning to provide more flexibility on uh, pilot actions, even considering having them from the start of the project, 
And uh, these practical elements will bring more flesh to the bones to uh, the policy exchanges that you will uh, have. And as a big change in terms of uh, philosophy of the program, we will no longer have uh, four different priorities. We will have only one uh, priority, which is our capacity building. And to further explain what it means, well, it means that uh, you will be able to tackle all the fields of uh, the cohesion policy. While uh, in the previous program, in the current program, we only had four of them. So you will be able to go uh, wherever the cohesion policy, wherever your policy instruments are leading you, this will better reflect uh, your needs and will help you also uh, to do um, projects on topics that are uh, uh, in between some uh, priorities. Uh, it can be, I don't know, something between uh, government and social or uh, smart and green. Um, so it will no longer be a clear demarcation between the, uh, the topics that you are covering in your projects. However, we plan to have at least 80% uh, of the projects financed in the smart and green uh, priorities, which if you look deeply into the content, uh, uh, goes on the same uh, content, the same topics that were available for this programming period. So in this sense, the transmission will be rather smooth for you and you will be able to proceed with the learnings uh, that you had in this program period towards the next one, if you want to recalibrate or uh, uh, let's say uh, have uh, the reloaded version of uh, your project, of course, focusing on uh, new knowledge. In terms of timing, in June, 2021, so this, Summer, we finalized uh, the cooperation program and we expect that by early 2022, we will have the approval uh, by, the, um, by the commission. And then uh, we expect to have the first uh, call launched somewhere in the first semester of 2022. So if we are looking at uh, approved projects or but when you will be able to start uh, new activities, new exchanges, it will probably be somewhere in the beginning of 2022. But uh, this is just a preview of our future program. We kindly invite you on the 24th and 25th of November to Europe, uh, let's cooperate. Uh, this is the traditional uh, annual event that we are having for our project. Uh, we'll have a cooperation pro forum. You will be able to exchange, to see the content from all projects, from all uh, intervention fields. And who knows, maybe you will be able to set the ground for, uh, for the new project for the next time period. But mostly, mostly this event will be about telling you uh, more in depth, how it will be, uh, how Interreg Europe will look in the future. And with uh, this uh, information, I would like to thank you for having the beginning of uh, this event. I would like to thank once again the, the projects for all the content that they are provided and mostly uh, on the topic of this, thing, uh, of this workshop will be shared uh, after my presentation. So. I can always uh, encourage you to keep sharing and uh, keep following our events. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Laurentiu. We really appreciate your update on, on what's going to happen next. And uh, I'm not uh, inviting questions directly now, but I, I, I do invite everybody to write questions into chat. And if we have some time at the end of the session, we will take all the questions uh, sent. If not, as I promised, we will get back to each of the questions individually. So please feel free to ask what you want from Laurentiu and, and write it into the chat. Uh, uh, and having said that, I would like now to move forward to our next speaker who comes from the same country as uh, myself. And uh, I'm happy to introduce my former colleague, uh, 
and uh, currently a member of a board of Talk to Science Park, Andrus, to share his story uh, how to make uh, local startups go global. So Andrus, please, the floor is yours and you have 20 minutes. Yeah, sorry guys, once again, let's try it. Prenea, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, now you can see my screen and both can see your you screen. Can hear all me. good, and we can hear you very well and see you very well. It's all, all red, your slides and so, your yes. overall, so <laughs> cool. Go ahead. <laughs> Greetings from uh, Tartu to Science Park and also from uh, Startup Talk to Community. Tartu is a second large city in, in Estonia. We have 90 5,000 inhabitants and 20,000 uh, students in the town. So we are an old student town. And uh, we like to think that we, we became smart as a smart city already in 1632, when the University of Tartu was established. So another fun fact about Tartu, maybe you already noticed that uh, in the world startup, you can see start to name. So we we have very active startup community in Tartu and all, also in, in Estonia. And I will briefly so an example. I will explain how we, what we do here in in Tartu. So um, yeah, but uh, let's start. Uh, uh, with the definition of, of a startup. And uh, I, I'm encouraging you uh, to add your own startup definition in, in the chat, because most probably we have plenty different understanding what is, is a startup. And a few years ago in, in Estonia, Minister of Entrepreneurship and IT started public discussion, what is the difference between limited liability company and, and a startup? And legally speaking, uh, yes, every startup in Estonia at least is, is somehow limited liability company, but not every limited liability company in Estonia is not a startup. So in Estonia, startup is based in technology and some innovation, usually it's innovation comes from business model. And uh, we have one secret, uh, which is uh, very common in our Estonian startups, and it's global growth potential. As Estonian domestic market so tiny, then it's very good for piloting or testing your ideas. But uh, from day one, you have to figure out where is your actual market is. It's most probably very different if you are starting your startup in Germany, which is large enough as a market you, and you don't need to expand foreign markets. And we have another layer in terms of time frame in Estonia, startups can be uh, have this uh, startup uh, status only uh, up to 10 years. So after 10 years, you, you are gone. You, we, we kick you out from our startup uh, database and you are not anymore startup. Obviously, it, uh, it caused some problems it, uh, in uh, deep tech startups, but this is how it is. So, and, and the Estonian startups in numbers, uh, during the last five years, the uh, startup sector has grown 30% per year. We have in our startup database over 1,200 startups, giving a job to over 6,000 employees, which is, by the way, 1% of employees pool in Estonia, and generating revenue almost 1 billion euros, which is almost 3% of uh, national GDP. And we have uh, in our startup scene, we have very bold uh, vision which is uh, to have 30% of Estonian GDP by 2030 from tech sector export. And obviously our startups raise a lot of money and over the last two, 12 years, they have raised 1.8 million billion euros, but this year exceptional. Uh, all in all, our startups already have raised 800 million euros. So we are growing very fast. And little snapshot about our um, unicorns. Uh, Playtech, which is located here in Tartu, Skype, most probably you have heard. Wise, which made an iPod a few 
few weeks ago or a month ago uh, at the London Stock Exchange market. Alt, Bytrive, Sigo, and so on. And uh, all those startups have something in common. And basically, they are software startups. And this is <laughs> what we at the Tartu Science Park try to change. We really want to put some T tech and space tech startups to have this unicorn status in the end. So in Estonia, we have uh, approximately, approximately 100 startup support organizations. And as a Tartu Science Park, we usually start working with deep or space tech teams or startups from pre-startup phase. And we're working with them until scale up, early scale up phase. And then we usually investors come in and then we, we, we back up and basically we kick off our startups from our programs and take in new ones. As a start to Science Park, we are the first science park in the Baltics. Uh, we have been home for innovative businesses already 29 years, and next year we will celebrate our 30th anniversary. And uh, our main like, core competence is uh, from the beginning is related to hardware. Usually today, uh, every hardware is, uh, is um, supported by software. But this is how we, we started in 1992 and we, we started off our incubation programs already in 1993. At that time, we, we just uh, named them like uh, providing business consultancy for SMEs. In 2006, we had like official startup incubation program. And uh, from that uh, period, we have two strong alumni click and grow and skeleton technologies and by the way skeleton technologies one of the oldest deep tech startups in our startup scene they they are, they are over 10 years old and but still in startup phase but most probably very near future they will be in huge success success uh, in estonia uh, in 2009, we, we established Protolab for prototyping services, and uh, we also co-founded our Build It Accelerator. But in 2017, we, we launched uh, a dedicated program, uh, incubation program from space tech uh, startups, and I will talk about later more. And we work closely with the University of Tartu uh, as a, our one funding partner uh, in terms of uh, helping science uh, science ideas to to commercialize in the market about other activities uh, in our main premises we have six office and laboratory building where 70 plus companies are working and uh, in the center of uh, thought we have demo center for which is called business card of uh, south estonia where we host different international delegations and also organize a lot of uh, entrepreneurial workshop and seminars and uh, before COVID we had uh, over 100 uh, events and we hosted over 6,000 visitors there and our brand new initiative which we opened last year is co-working uh, office in the center of uh, Tartu where we also have gathered all our startups whom we working for or we working with so this was all about introduction, but now it's main topic and it's about uh, European Space Agency Business Incubation Center in Estonia. And you have 10 minutes, Santos. Yes, yes. I know, I know, I know. Thank you, René. Basically, uh, in Estonia, we can go, Estonian space history go, goes back 200 years when the first observatory was established in Tartu. But we started uh, to work with the uh, European Space Agency in 2007 and 2015, we, we, we became full member of ESA. And two years before, we had very successful student satellite launch SQ-1, which operated in orbit two years. And, uh, and this is what was like first uh, cornerstone of our space tech scene in, in Estonia. In 2017, we opened ESA Big Estonia for space tech companies. And this slide, you can see that uh, space is, is it's not only like uh, space missions, but uh, we, we, we use a lot of space data and, and, uh, and telecommunication every, in our everyday life. And it's, it's, it's relatively, you can find space tech or data in every 
every industry. So it's very broad uh, definition. It's also its largest space innovation network in the world, but it's not only for startups. It's also for SMEs who would like to develop their uh, their their business further using uh, space technology or data. So, and uh, you can become as a partner of ESA and uh, and uh, one procurements and so on. Regarding the incubation network, we in in Europe we have twenty two incubators. Uh, and uh, in 60 locations and over 1100 startups have supported so far and it's massive uh, and uh, the maybe maybe the famous uh, from this network is lilium which is uh, vertically taking off and landing a taxi for future cities what we offer to our incubation incubation uh, during the incubation for startups and mainly technical support thanks to our uh, technical partners uh, up to eight hours and also business development support uh, up to two years and very 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 important to offer also money and we offer 50,000 euros as a non-equity funding for product and IP development. Uh, on this slide you can see our partners, uh, technical partners, incentive scheme partners, our incubation partners, and also loan partners, which is very important to build an ecosystem around the incubation program that you can expand uh, your competencies and, and uh, work uh, based on uh, different cases and uh, offer, uh, offer, offer competence in various scenes. So we opened uh, the CESA in Estonia in 2017. At that time, we had in Estonia zero space tech startups. We have organized eight selection campaigns and, uh, and received 48 applications. We onboarded 19 startups, 10 still in program and eight alumni, and one default, which is also okay. And the economical impact of our 19 startups, which is relatively young because they just started or started let's say four years ago we have uh, gave them funding as uh, 700,000 euros they have multiplied it uh, up to 5.7 million euros which is consist of grants and uh, venture capital they have uh, hired 97 uh, employee and uh, and the paid labor taxes and and cumulative turnover are also over four million euros which is insane if we talk about space tech uh, startups and just a couple of examples about uh, space uh, startups first hepta airport it's funded in 2017 uh, so far they have received total funding 2.7 million euros uh, now they are preparing next A round uh, up to 2 million euros to expand their operation in different uh, markets. They have created 939 uh, new jobs and, and the market is basically uh, limited, unlimited because they are offering uh, autonomous drone uh, services for power line expansions and uh, automated analysis uh, based on AI. And in other, uh, as HEPTA is uh, uh, close to the earth, then uh, another uh, an example from space, uh, from new space, uh, SpaceIt, which is offers mission control as a service to satellite operators and also offering a number of simulators for cyber security uh, tests. Also founded uh, six years ago, and this year they, they, they finally got their first uh, pre-seed funding, 1 million euros. And it shows me that uh, the, in deep tech and space tech uh, field, it, it might take a lot of time to raise your firm funding. But uh, hopefully during this, uh, the, thanks to the, this funding, they will move from startup phase to scale up phase and, uh, and they uh, there is a, again an increasing number of satellite launches, so they they can have very good share on the market. So last but not least, 
couple of uh, valuable lessons as an incubation program provider. First of all, try to onboard team instead of solo founders, especially if you onboard teams of scientists or engineers, then try to take, take a look. Is there someone who is uh, willing to take CEO position and go door to door and sales the idea to potential customers? Uh, agree in the very beginning with the founders that uh, they need to put very long commitment and uh, sweat the capital if you wish. Uh, for example, this uh, space, it, uh, it, took, uh, it took six years to uh, raise first funding. So especially in deep and space tech, you need long, uh, long commitment. Uh, global potential versus regional potential is not a question in Estonia, at least, because as I mentioned, our domestic market is so tiny. So from day one, you have to figure out where is your actual market, but maybe it's different from uh, in Germany or in France. Uh, definitely provide to startups hands on mentors and less patient business angels and uh, and very valuable are those founders who just went through this process uh, from uh, struggling to raise funding struggling to validate the business idea struggling to uh, uh, develop the product and they are uh, they are very valuable uh, mentors for new newcomers as well and obviously deal with the founders' expectations. Usually we, when you start talking with uh, uh, new founders uh, and they have only concept on the paper, they, they really believe that the pre-money valuation, valuation can be over 10 million <laughs> without the revenue and so on. So there is a lot of uh, managing of expectation of founders. But before I say thank you, one, uh, one small advertising from from Tartu as well. As I mentioned, we are we have very active uh, startup uh, community in Tartu, and we have organizing uh, uh, business festival startup day already five times, uh, and it's the biggest business festival in in politics, and some say even the best business festival in Europe. And uh, this year we had three hundred. 30 startups and the cash pool for pitching uh, competition was over a half million euros. So it's a, your opportunity to, to come and visit Tartu and the Estonia startup scene in the end of January. So if it's possible, see you in Tartu. And if you want to discuss something with me or you want to drop a, an email for me, then here you find my contact information and uh, ping me on LinkedIn. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anders, so much for your excellent presentation. And I am impressed uh, in two ways. Uh, <laughs> the, the first, first way I'm impressed is by you being able to keep time exactly almost by second. And that very rarely happens, I can confirm. So former moment. banking guy. <laughs> and second, secondly, I'm really impressed uh, by your ambition, because you know, when uh, normally people talk about scale up activities, this means going to another market, like for instance, from Estonia to Germany. But you have taken a completely new dimension, taking it from Earth to the space and perhaps other, to other planets as well. So, so keep yeah, up. Why not? But still, you know, the money is still in on, on Earth, not in space. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> at least uh, not yet. Exactly. Um, as, as you were doing so, so good in terms of timekeeping, uh, we have two quick questions which have already been presented in chat, but I would ask Andrus to be short and precise in answering them. Uh, All right. so the first, uh, first question is, that is there any time limit for your companies in the incubator? And uh, do you have any data what has happened to those companies after they have left from incubator? Yeah, sure. First of all, uh, we incubate them uh, from 12 months up to 24 months. And uh, obviously, in in middle of incubation period, we have midterm review. If we have we seeing uh, commitment and effort and uh, and progress, then we will continue. If not, then we, we will say thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe next time. And we, we keep uh, contact with our alumni uh, and they gave us every year, once a year, uh, feedback, how they are doing. And another question there, uh, how actively is Start to Science Park using different EU funds, in particular Interreg Europe program, 
and uh, is, is it really useful for startups? Yes, we, 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 are, we are very active and uh, we have even a dedicated department for that. And yes, we involve uh, startups uh, to these activities and uh, we, we, we will be working for startups. And very final question there. Uh, how does Start Science Park analyze the demand for internationalization and scale up activities of SMEs to kind of build your relevant support programs? So how, how you take into account uh, this dimension in order to build your offer? Yeah, it's uh, going through this loop. You, you, you build, you test, you learn and you, you, you improve, right? So we, that, that same uh, goes with us as well. We, we, are, we don't say that we know anything, but we, we test a lot. Great. All right, Andrus, thank you once again for excellent presentation and good luck with your scaling up activities to space and beyond. So. Yes, thank you. And uh, now while Andrus will stop sharing his screen, I will invite our next uh, speaker uh, who is uh, representing uh, a Creative Business Academy, Rasmus, if you are ready, please share your screen and share with us some of your experiences in how to scale up uh, creative businesses uh, in Europe. All right, I see already Rasmus your screen, so when you're ready you can start. There we go. Hi, Tom. Uh, it's very, very happy. Thank you for this invitation to speak about the Creative Business Academy. Here at Creative Business Network, we work with startups from the culture and creative industries. They typically have a harder time uh, growing. Their business development is more difficult than other startups. It could be because of the sectors that they're in. If you're in fashion, you have to predict what people will be wearing. If you're in toys, you have to predict in March what people will buy for Christmas in December. Uh, it could also be the background of many of the founders. They come, don't come from business schools or from technical universities. Uh, we know also that they have a harder time accessing finance. They have a, a larger part of the value that they create is IPR based, is a symbolic value like the design of a belt or a, or a bag. And also they're more internationally or oriented. From the very start as a startup, whether it's from Estonia, Denmark or elsewhere, the market is, uh, is global. I just want to say as a, as a small uh, curiosity, we have worked very well with uh, Estonia for the last couple of years with a company called Love SD, which I thought means love Estonia, but it actually means creative Estonia. And uh, Kaya Kalas, your present prime minister, has also been speaking at our events. And on the 14th of October, I want to do a small advertisement for an event where Taiva, uh, Taibi Roivas, who also has been one of our jury members, one of your former prime ministers, will come. This is about how can the public sector be better at working with startups in general, which is an important uh, 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 issue because the public markets are big. So B to G to government, uh, but also how can the, the, the public sector be better at working with creatives and artists, etc. So this kind of, of new way. And, and here, Ty, uh, Tyler Roybas will come and speak, and that's so that's on the 14th of October. And also, just to put another feather in the hat of the Estonians participating here, uh, Raiku. Uh, as an Estonian startup that actually wants to replace bubble wrap with a much more um, uh, sustainable material, uh, won the global finals for 2020 that we held this year in 2021, in the end of June. So the 2020 winner of the Creative Business Cup global finals was actually Raiku from Estonia. So enough pitching for Estonia right now. So um, I am, I, Creative Business Network is based in Denmark. But we work globally, we have partners in 80 countries, and I, we all have these challenges that I mentioned before that the startups are facing. And uh, I think it's important, let me just see how I can change the slide here. So there we go. So uh, we then have over time developed this online business development and international conversation course for startups within the creative industries. So we focused on the sectors that you can see in front of you, your fashion, entertainment, music, design, architecture. But as uh, Nesta has shown, there are actually more creatives employed in non-creative sectors. 
uh, and they make create a lot of value for banks and for for transportation, etc. So we also look at these uh, borderline areas where creative skills and methods are uh, employed in health, sustainability, mobility, education, food, etc. Uh, we have right we right now launched a big uh, uh, initiative with the WHO, the World Health Organization, on how creatives and how culture can actually contribute to public health. Maybe mothers with postnatal depressions are better treated with uh, some cre creative methods, such as singing, rather than with medication. Maybe there's actually a, a true uh, cost benefit in doing it that way. Let me just change my slide here. So the Creative Business Academy, what is unique? What is this way of scaling so that the creatives, uh, the, the creative startups, the startups from these sectors that I mentioned before? Well, first of all, we focus on those startups. We say that, that there is a difference between these kind of startups that have a different business model and they have actually different challenges. When, when for example, your design is what drives the value of your, of your company, of this uh, design company you have or this fashion company you have, the fact that it can be so easily copied uh, falls, uh, uh, actually create a completely different challenge. Just to take that as, a, as an example. And then we also focus very much with this academy on the business development through internationalization. So how can the fact that you go global, you're born global, and the fact that you try to reach other markets uh, be part of your, inter you know, not an add-on to a strategy, but actually is the way that you develop your, uh, your, your, uh, your, your business. Then we also need to find some knowledgeable speakers on this area. People that know that the fashion industry is different, that gaming is different, that the, that is that the financing is different. If you have two hundred cows and you want to go to the bank and borrow uh, to buy another two hundred cows, so you have four hundred, then the bank will say, "Okay, good. I'll put uh, in. I'll take safety in the, your present two hundred cows." That's very different if you're a, a movie director, director, or a, 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 someone who works with fashion, because what will the next thing be? Of course. You can build on your past, but if you're starting up as a, as a young designer or a innovator in this field, then it can be really, really difficult. Then we also include many other business cases and we're not afraid of talking about failures. We're not afraid to say that our uh, 2012 Creative Business Cup Global Finalist winner is no longer existing. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's not in, uh, in, in business anymore. And the 2013 uh, winner, uh, Teddy the Guardian, a teddy bear with medical sensors inside that could monitor the heart rate and, and the general conditions of a child is also no longer, you know, big and, and boisterous, but the technologies that we used are definitely there. They were up on stage together with Obama back in 2014. They didn't very well, but the, the, the failure uh, of that company to go through, uh, we also uh, uh, highlight because there's lots of learnings from that. And then what's really, really important, I think, in this area is also the peer-to-peer uh, networking and learning. That's why we have a continuous network among the startups, the speakers and the investors on thisis.cbnet.com. So, well, so what do we do? We have this, uh, this academy course that, that is running. Uh, the startups that have participated are selected by our national partners. So, Lov Esti in, uh, in Estonia, uh, the Austrian Wirtschaftsservice in, in, in Austria, and, and so on. So we have different partners that select. And in Nigeria, we had 5,500 uh, startups that applied. And uh, so you can imagine the best of those 5,500, they're pretty darn good. Um, we focus on these areas that I talked about before, business development, internationalization, access to finance, IPR. And then also, since much of this is based on trends and, and where things are going, what we will be wearing, what we will be eating, listening to, reading, experiencing, but then uh, also market analysis and trends is really important. Uh, has it worked? Uh, for the last couple of academies, 9.5 to 9.9 .9 or so say that it works, that it works well, that, that this way, this method, method in going uh, digital works. And these quotes you can see, I will, uh, I will skip them and move on. So uh, for us, what matters is uh, of course, the fact that these startups and SMEs from the culture and creative sector create jobs and growth and, and uh, exports, usually it's between 8 and 12% of most modern economies, the creative industries, depending on how you 
count them in and it's becoming difficult because they spill over into other sectors. Uh, but also there are actually some, some, some great solutions out there that needs to be developed, that needs to be financed, that needs to go to other, uh, to other parts of the world. Uh, for example, uh, the, the winner from Nigeria that uses a, a method to actually with, uh, to, to clean water where you put in uh, uh, small, small, small micro pieces of wood into clay and then you burn it and then you have a fantastic filter. That is new in Nigeria, but it's not new in Central America. But the, the impact on clean water in, in Nigeria is, is, is something that you can definitely feel. So uh, what, have we, what have we learned over this uh, last uh, uh, couple of years when we've done this? And who we are, let's see here. Let's just stay with this. Whoa. It's difficult to, to run it like that. There we go. So what have we learned? Well, first of all, to, to run it online, uh, create a great advantage in the, in the sense that we can bring in, you know, the best of the best from anywhere. We can bring in Kaya Kalas and Tavi Roivas, although they have all participated when it was before Corona. Uh, but we can also bring in the former editor of Entrepreneur Magazine. Uh, we can bring in the, the person who invented Windows, uh, the, not the Windows that in the buildings, but the, the program. Uh, so that is a possibility to bring in these. And when you bring in someone like uh, Harry Koponen, who was the CEO of Angry Birds at Rovio, and he says, yeah, I'll speak for half an hour, and he speaks up at speaking for an hour and a half in dialogue with the startups, then it really becomes positive, it really becomes hands-on. Uh, we have learned, of course, that engagement in these uh, digital sessions is important, that we shouldn't do like I'm doing right now, talking, presenting, and then more or less ignoring what goes on in among the audience because it's difficult to do everything at once. Uh, but to use Mentimeters and Kahoots and, and uh, uh, experiential learning in this online will increase engagement. That is uh, the, 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 the difficult part with that engagement. Then also all the subtleties, all the, I can't see which of you are actually zooming out or, or leaning back or checking your phones. Uh, so these subtleties that you have with, a, with a actually meeting with people that you can do at the, in Tartu when you actually meet people face to face, they, uh, they disappear. Then also uh, finding out what really creates value because uh, what creates value in one place of the world might not create value in another place of the world. So these, uh, this creating value and really discovering and be having an open mind to uh, what is really a problem somewhere and what isn't a problem. Uh, that is something that, uh, that is uh, also uh, a learning that uh, I keep on being uh, 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 surprised about and, and uh, have to be hum humble about, uh, such as uh, clean water and how that can be achieved. Then, of course, as always, as with all learning programs, it's also this workshop here today is to find the right balance between the general and the specific. Because when you bring together startups and SMEs in the culture and creative sectors from either all over the world or just from Africa and Europe, and by the way, I think it's a, there's a great value in having, for example, startups from the Nordics and the Caribbean together in one, you know, session uh, or one uh, academy because actually these uh, differences actually will, will uh, continue uh, and, uh, and will uh, enhance the program. But uh, the general specific, so, so finding stuff that can actually be good for everyone, uh, but isn't too obvious, that isn't too something that will go, oh, what the, you know, that is, and then not being so specific that it only pertains to the very few uh, participants in, in a program. Can we draw learnings? Um, and uh, you might think uh, those sectors that I showed in the beginning, gaming, music, movies, fashion, et cetera, publishing, they're all sectors in themselves, but they are quite different. But actually we have made several studies and we can see that the, the creative, cultural and creative industries are much more coherent in their challenge structure, the challenges that they're facing than many other sectors. Just look at the transportation sectors that are airlines and uh, railroads and ports and uh, buses and uh, maybe also the, the, the restaurants where you do the pit stop at the highways. But they're much more coherent, the creative industries, than many other sectors. And, uh, and uh, you can actually uh, draw learnings and you can actually do something across the board 
for all these different subsectors, I'd rather call them, uh, and you will do something good <coughs> for all. Then I think the peer-to-peer -peer learning uh, is also something we've learned uh, uh, has to be uh, established, the trust among the startups and the SMEs, and what they can learn and what they can do uh, together uh, is also something that always has to be emphasized uh, and, and highlighted. Uh, obviously, the Nigerian uh, winner that creates these great uh, water sanitation uh, pots out of clay that uh, have these microfilters that actually uh, filter out also bacteria. Uh, they, one of the biggest problems is transportation around uh, Nigeria where the roads are quite, quite bad. So the, the, these clay pots, they, they break on, some of them do. Well, luckily we have Raiku from Estonia that have the solution to that, an alternative to bubble wrap that will make sure that they don't break uh, on, the, on the bad roads of Nigeria. So this peer-to-peer uh, -peer support and this working together is something that's really uh, good. I have uh, in the chat uh, sent a link uh, where, uh, just before my presentation, on uh, the top seven from 2020 and 2021. And I'm also, after my presentation, just share some of the successful uh, creative business network startups that some of you, you may know. You may have worked with Miro, for example, a, a Russian startup that came to us a couple of years ago and also others. So um, this is pretty much the end of my presentation here. So who are we? The Creative Business Network is a network uh, that's global, that covers some 80 plus countries most European countries, uh, many Africans, many Asians, many Central and, and South Americans. And, um, and we really try to make sure that this is not just about more shoes, hats and gloves. So just producing more for more, like we often uh, see in the creative industries, that the, for example, the fa fashion industry is one of the most polluting ones, uh, but it's actually about change. It's about the SDGs, it's about uh, a better world that will benefit both industry and society. So um, Aita, again, thank you. And uh, if there are any questions, then please go ahead. Thank you so much, Rasmus. Uh, that was a great pleasure to hear your experience in creative industries. And also thank you for keeping the time exactly as, as we agreed, much appreciated. Uh, uh, indeed, we have now uh, time for, for a couple of questions. And uh, while uh, uh, people still might write there. First of all, I, I wanted to also thank you for saying good words about my own country, which I can assure we didn't coordinate in advance, so, so it wasn't necessary, but, but of course it's always good to hear. But uh, I, I want to ask you about uh, um, your key learnings, sir. And uh, well, first of all, do you think uh, scaling up businesses in uh, uh, creative industries is more difficult and more challenging than, for instance, let's say in software development or, or, or I mean, what, what, what is your general take? Is it think, the more that's... difficult scale up area or not? Yeah, as, as I said, one of the, some of the learnings uh, in, the, in the format I talk about, but it's true, uh, <coughs> there are some challenges that are different. And the, one of them is, the fact that you cannot just, uh, it's not just a coding problem, just, I know it's, uh, it's so, so with the, with the cultural and creative industries, you might see some business development problems and scaling problems that are not technical, that are, that are completely uh, different. And often you also see many uh, creative companies, you see the, you talk about this, the suits and the t-shirts. You need a, a suit person that's usually a Mr. No or a Mrs. No. And then you have this the creative that is the one that also uh, is the, out, the outgoing person of the company that will then uh, then also that is the creative one. So often you have, need to have that dualism, and it's, it's often uh, difficult to find that in one person. You can see it in Cirque du Soleil. I would like to remind everyone that Cirque du Soleil started out with a guy whose main competence was to walk on stilts, and for the first eleven years, eleven years, it re received support from the Canadian Arts Council, the Canadian Arts Council, and not from a business development program like this. Uh, and then it became on to become uh, what it is uh, today. I know they have some difficulties due to Corona, uh, but uh, actually our partner in Canada, Zoo, is the accelerator that uh, Cirque du Soleil has created. So there are some, some differences in business development. Of course, also a strong focus on IPR. 
Uh, our winner in 2019 was from Denmark, Lapi. It's a urinal for women. For some reason, we haven't really considered the fact that women also need to go to the toilet when they participate in marathons or in big, uh, uh, big uh, festivals, rock concerts, etc. cetera. Uh, Lapi uh, made that focus, but they really had a hard time finding investors because most of the investors are men and don't really see that problem. So, uh, or cannot discuss that problem. Uh, if you're a Chinese investor, for example. So I, th I think uh, with, and with the startup like uh, with uh, Lapi, they have both a design protection, uh, they have a patent, uh, and uh, they, also have, uh, they also have a brand protection, so to speak, for Lapi. So they have three different, uh, and, and often that, so we, we have a lot of focus on, on, on also IPR issues, protection, and putting it part of a strategy and not something you just add on at the end. Thank you very much. And now, uh, final question, uh, Rasmus, sir, and, and if you can be brief and brief, what would be your, uh, uh, based on your experience in, in terms of scaling up uh, uh, creative industries companies, what does the two most important success factors which help actually those type of companies to, to go international and global. What what is a key determiner for, if, if you can mention two, one, in your opinion? What I would mention very briefly would be openness. Often creatives, uh, they are, they can be, because it comes from them, uh, quite sensitive in being open to uh, suggestions from outside. Why can't you make that orange instead of red, you know? Don't say that to someone who's been working on that for two weeks, which, which color is right. So, so this, uh, this the, the need for an openness to input and to work in teams is really, uh, really important. Uh, I think another one is going global right away. I think also that, that pushes uh, a startup to test the markets uh, in, a very, in a very fast way, because it is not limited to just the 1.6 million people in Estonia or the 5.6 in Denmark, when you're working in fashion, gaming, music, or movies, you can actually look at the right market right away, but you also uh, have to be ready for that. So uh, pushing, putting internationalization quite early on in the process. Well, all right. Thank you so much for, uh, for uh, those answers. And uh, I wish you all luck uh, with scaling up creative industries in Europe and in the world. And uh, if there are any further questions, then please write them to the chat, to Rasmus. If not, then uh, we are moving now to our parallel sessions. As I already announced, nobody needs to do anything. You just stay where you are, look at your computer screen, and uh, you will be transferred automatically to the session, which you already uh, pre-registered, that's a, a registration phase. And uh, the parallel session will be about uh, one hour and we will have a short introduction of each parallel session at the beginning. Uh, so I guess in a few minutes, uh, uh, we will meet in, in those two different uh, groups. And thank you everybody once again uh, in terms of uh, sharing with us uh, experiences. And thank you uh, for listening and asking questions and see you in a second in breakout sessions. Scale up that instrument. They will also scale up that instru instrument and, and export it to, to other countries. Uh, what was uh, the approach of Olga and Jalanta from Poland? It was very different. Um, and, and, and in total, the, the, the Swedish partner spent some around uh, 300,000 euro for, for such initiative and it started as an EU project and now it's, it's uh, automatically working and operated by, by the bank and, it's, and the network of the navigators they have established. In case of the Polish example, they started from a political decision that there was a government visit four years ago from Nevada to Poland to different regions and there was some kind of quick uh, connecti connectivity among the participants. And then they agreed that they want to move on with this political level decision to operational level. And in, in, in the next year, they've, they've uh, agreed and signed a grant that Nevada governor and the local regional president will support uh, inter uh, bilateral meetings and actions. 
and they have implemented two ways. In one of the ways, uh, they have chosen startups, and those startups were invited to a five-day training, 30 companies, where they were practicing presentation skills and so on with American partner partners. And then 20 were invited to a jury day, and 10 were selected to go to the US to establish direct uh, uh, relations with American partners. And it was a series of meetings with potential clients and so on. And the, in the next wave, the, the, the first wave, it was assisted by an external consultant. In the next wave, they could do it themselves already. It means they cut the cost to half. And this, this time they brought SMEs there. And what is also very interesting is that they brought their 10 and 10 companies. And uh, now there are three successful openings in, in, in Nevada and also other corporations started. So it's, uh, it's also interesting that there was skepticism at the beginning as I, I could understand what would happen in a Polish countryside as I'm living in a Hungarian countryside. But after the first wave, they have learned that it's something that is feasible and it was easier for the other players to accept that it's, it's something realistic for them for the later phases as well. And then we listened to a very, very different presentation from Vivi from the European Investment Fund the representative. Just to give you the scale, so it's 700,000, then it was 150,000 euros. And in this case, it was 500 million euros that we talked about. And here, here the challenge was that how to help uh, investment for companies where traditional financial bankers or financial institutes are not financing, which are classically the high risk and high growth uh, companies, which were the target. And this, it's a mixture of, of EU fund and, and private investor fund. And they have developed a, a system where they categorize three different kinds of segments. One is the, the, the researcher segment or, or the very early stage then the startup segment and then the scale up and and the ratio of the public and and, and the private financing was changing all the time so in, in case of the researcher and innovator it was dominantly public in case of the startup it was 70 percent public and in case of the scale up it was roughly half half so and and they started this program to to facilitate that there's um, greek researchers and innovation and it's not transferred into business opportunity strong enough. And this is what they were uh, catalyzing. And uh, they launched it in 2017. And in three years, they have supported and incentivized uh, 116 companies. And these companies are high risk and high potential uh, return on investment companies. And it, it shows very well about the exit. So 116 companies supported only three exits in three years, but one exit was 360 million euros. So it, it shows really well what it means, high risk and high potential companies to be subsidized in such a system. It's uh, also very important here that it was a national instrument. There was a very heavy marketing and commitment from all level of stakeholders to initiate such a change. And now since there is paybacks, it's a, it's a self-sustainable system that they have created there. So that's basically, I don't know, I don't know how I quickly summarized the learnings. Thank I you. Have. Thank you. Thank you, Polos, for your summary and, and well representing so, so the main uh, takeaways and learning points from our discussion. And now I would like to ask uh, John, from uh, who was uh, uh, discussion for the uh, benchmarking of internationalization approaches in the parallel session number two to take the floor and, and share some of the key learnings and points which were presented in your session. Yeah, okay. Well, I mean, just very briefly, we had three excellent presentations from uh, Muthia region on the scale up project traction. We had a presentation from Normandy uh, on the export accelerator, and we had uh, from um, Ostrobotnia in Finland. Uh, the fridge project, um, all sort of very much addressing sort of systemic issues. Uh, I think the Muthia one, as I understand it, is really about mentoring. So getting those internationalizing businesses to support new entrants to the marketplace through a supply chain or to give them the benefit of their experiences and knowledge and wisdom to enhance their potential for being successful internationally. Uh, the Normandy example was a good one because it talks very much about uh, business support organizations working together collaboratively from the national level down through to the, the regional level 
to ensure that SMEs that are have the potential to to go international can very quickly get their plans off the ground and 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 and, and get out there and start being uh, successful internationally. And then the uh, Ostrobotnia example was very much around a specific food in industry aspect and very much uh, you know looking at how the uh, the processes by which those um, food uh, industry SMEs need to, to, to sort of undertake to um, get out into the international marketplace. I think all three presentations raise interesting sort of issues in relating to teamwork, working together, respecting each other's roles, um, making use of the, the, the wide support that's available, that it's not duplicated, um, the, the sort of uh, guiding SMEs through a, very, very, a series of internationalization steps by using this, this systemic approach drawing on the best within the, the, the business support ecosystem was, was highlighted by, by all of the three uh, presentations. And equally, uh, the need to survey SMEs to get their, their input and their feedback, uh, and measuring and reviewing and constantly going through that virtuous loop to improve the, the business support system, which fundamentally has to be highly effective if, if they're gonna get the attention of SMEs to um, you know, draw on their support. It really needs to be uh, you know, top class and uh, and joined up and uh, you know those resources need to work together very very closely. Thank you John for uh, also excellent summary of, uh, of the presentations uh, you had in parallel session number two and uh, now we can move to our very last uh, speaker today uh, and I would like to invite uh, Mr. Igor Kalinic from uh, European Commission uh, to share the uh, plans with the upcoming single market program and, and to tell us also what and what kind of possibilities are there for supporting scale-ups in Europe. So Igor, if you are ready, I would like to invite you to, to take the floor and share your screen. My microphone, of course, was muted. Uh, so... Oh, <laughs> Uh, someone was saying that you are muted was the most popular war, uh, <laughs> word on the internet in the last year or something okay. like that. Uh, so, um, okay, thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much for this a very interesting presentation. Actually, let me just uh, share my screen. Uh, and uh, you should be able to see... Yeah, it's it's all good. Just make it full screen. But yeah, of course, screen. I was looking for that. Mm -hmm. Great. So uh, one thing that I wanted to say is that thank you very much for the a very interesting presentation, uh, and also I'm personally also quite interested in uh, in sessions like this because previously before starting my career. program or what will be the SME pillar uh, of the SMP program, single market program. Now, uh, before going into detail about the program, I would like also to say that I, I, I hear you and we hear you. Uh, we agree with what a lot what has been said. And actually, uh, many of you have uh, mentioned action that we are already doing as uh, good practices. Uh, I remember uh, um, clusters. So going international and growing through the clusters, it's a, definitely one of the safest and best way to uh, do for a small company. But uh, we have also some other ad hoc in, in initiatives, especially in the field of the internationalization, uh, for example, international uh, IP uh, help desk that can help companies protect their uh, IP intellectual property rights 
in uh, sensitive markets. Uh, so we have them in China, uh, one for Latin America, and one some for Southeast Asia, and the new one started last year in India. But we also have ad hoc EU SME centers that provide information for China and uh, also the one center in Japan. And actually, just for curiosity, this uh, center is called EU Japan Center for Industrial Cooperation. And it was set back in 1989 by the Council. And just to uh, see how the world has changed, of course, in 89, uh, the center was set as uh industrial cooperation and uh, now actually activity it has to be set again to nowadays it would be probably something like eu japan sme center because of course and nowadays the um, the big companies go directly they really don't need that much help from the from the, the country and the state level um whereas it is very important for the smes um also, uh, one thing that we will really endorse is uh, this, you guys that are in contact with the companies, with the SMEs directly, it is indeed very important to um, make them immediately aware that to develop also an international plan, an internationalization plan. And this internationalization plan should not be only looking at the export or outward activities, but also inwards. They have to get supply from wherever it is, China, other European countries. And that's also important. That's also one aspect of uh, internationalization that often is neglected. Um, and uh, we know uh, also in the Interreg report is reported that uh, it's only a limited number of SMEs exports, but also a limited number of SMEs can export because when we talk about SMEs, it's a huge world of whatever we can put uh, businesses to put inside. So not everybody can export. And so the yeah, actions should be also quite targeted on who can actually help, okay, who can actually benefit from, uh, from the international uh, export uh, activities. Um, also, uh, we have uh, posed uh, attention to the sustainable way of growing. And this is actually very much what is in line with the European uh, tradition. Now I'm a little bit more putting my head of uh, professor than of the uh, European Commission. Sorry, I, little... sorry, Igor, to yeah. interrupt you, but it seems that the, your slides are not moving. I know they're not moving because I'm still not on slides. Okay, okay, fine, sorry. <laughs> I was a little bit uh, rephrasing what uh, has been done, but yeah. uh, I will go on the slides and on the uh, meat of my presentation. Okay, sorry. Uh, of course. Uh, so just uh, one last thing. It's uh, when we go to the United States and it's very important just to make your enterprise grow. Whereas in Europe, the entrepreneur wants to keep it more under control and to grow less. So, but it's also more sustainable. So we have more uh, family-owned companies throughout the generation. So this is a landscape that is changing. And it's uh... now going to my presentation. Uh, I will talk uh, briefly about the single market program and mm, especially about the SME pillar. So, of course, the single market program is the EU funding program to help the single market reach the full potential and ensure Europe's recovery from the COVID-19 pandemics. Now, can you see my next slide? I moved... I think. Yes, yes. very well. Uh, we can. Oh, mm -hmm. Okay, sure. so this is a little bit the agenda. I will go through it and uh, try uh, to stay in the next 10 minutes, so not to so, uh, overstep my the time allocated. Uh, so the single market, of course, is the cornerstone of the union. In, in the last 30 years, that was basically the biggest innovation, or, I mean, the biggest focus also of the, um, of the European Commission. And it's really strategically important for, for the existence of the European Union. Um, now, we, uh, there has been many, many, many different programs that have been activated and then that have more or less all tried to contribute to the well-functioning of the single market. 
Um, so we have, uh, I would say previously, but also currently we had a lot of different programs uh, that uh, have been working somehow in, uh, in improving the single market. But uh, now the idea is to put six of them into one uh, to improve the synergies to better coordinate the actions, to achieve better value for money and provide uh, for greater visibility of the program. So, you know, very well that sometimes we have their answer, but the citizens, the entrepreneurs uh, or the supporting organizations uh, cannot really easily find the, the, what they are looking for. Um, very quickly uh, here the project uh, the new single market program is are about 4.2 billion euros uh, and let's say it has five main objectives and one overall so uh, the objective uh, so five main pillars and one uh, overall uh, let's say um, cap that is about european statistics uh, the first uh, five pillars are internal market, COSME or SME pillar, uh, which is uh, the one that we are interested in today, European standards, uh, consumer protection, food safety. In all of this, you can find something that can support the SMEs for growth. I will touch marginally on the, the others and I will focus on COSME because this is the one that, that what we are really um, on focus today. Uh, so the competitiveness of SMEs. So wh what is this pillar about? This pillar comes from the previous COSME program, builds heavily on it, and basically it's a continuation. So it's about strengthening the competitiveness and sustainability of small and medium enterprises. The aims are to facilitate access to markets, promote entrepreneurship, and the acquisition of entrepreneurial skills and promote the modernization of the industry. We, and here with the modernization of the industry and others global. So the, here we have uh, in the, in, uh, within this uh, aim, we have also in the internationalization, but also advanced technologies. And I think that it makes a lot of sense to put it together because basically if you want a high tech company, a startup, a scale up, however you want to call it and to grow and to expand, well, basically the internationalization is there inside. It's, it's impossible to, to think about these companies as not being even glo uh, born global. Uh, so uh, when we come to the uh, COSME program, uh, and I heard that also uh, mentioned earlier. Well, we have two types of instruments, non-financial instruments and financial instruments. And this is what we were talking about uh, before. Uh, this e, um, the, so this here, we can see that these are uh, done activities under InvestEU. So these are the funds that are transferred to the, um, let's say, national um, players, financial players, and, the, and then these ones provide credits, loans uh, directly to the SMEs. Whereas the non-financial instruments, which are again financial in the meaning that there are funds that are given out, but they are not directly provided to the SMEs, uh, less in a specific, with some specific type of grants, but these are uh, really fostering in improving the capacity of the entire ecosystem to provide support to the SMEs for their growth and for their extension. So today I will uh, focus on this part. Um, now we have uh, fl three flagship initiatives that are Enterprise Europe Network, joint cluster initiatives and Erasmus for young entrepreneurs. Probably you all know very well about Enterprise Europe Network is the biggest network of business supporting organizations in the world. There are more than 60, around 60 countries involved. So it's not only Euro EU countries, but there are really countries all around the world that have joined the network and keep joining the network. And this network is really uh, focused on providing the first step information to the SME. So when uh, somebody comes and asks me, a friend says, hey, I have an idea. What about this? What about that? Uh, like, okay, do you have any money in the European Union? The first thing that I say, like contact your local enterprise Europe network. They are there 
to see and they have the overlook on, on the entirety of the actions that we have put in the place. Uh, about the clusters, we have already talked about that. And one that is not really for growing, but this is more for, um, for young entrepreneurs to start being entrepreneurs, it's, uh, I think, a very nice initiative. It's called Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs. Now, main themes that are there. So, of course, I already talked about internationalization, so I anticipated a little bit. It's IP Help Desk, China and Japan SME Center, but there are also ad hoc initiatives. Uh, when it comes to the fields, to the sectors, well, we have uh, tourism, construction, public procurement, skills, entrepreneurship. There are a lot of different themes. So uh, this is not really focused on one specific sector or industry, but it's really in, in a number of sectors. A special focus is given also to the tourism, uh, given the recent COVID uh, situation that this sector has been really hit hard. And then also within this uh, program, um, also the general SME policies are uh, founded. And here we uh, have uh, the particular scale up and startup initiatives. So we know that actually the European companies have this problem of making the step further. From now we have tons of startups, but we need to make them grow further. And now probably something that you will be quite well, well uh, much focused about is how to uh, have access. So basically there are two big uh, ways, call for tenders, call for proposals. And, and then we have also something more specific, which are pay more contracts or that ad hoc grants. Ad hoc grants are usually with interinstitutional cooperation, for example, with the OACD or something like that. And, but when it comes uh, to, um, uh, let's say direct support to the business supporting organization. It's uh, usually, I would say, call for proposals. And in this call for proposals, sometimes we ask the consortia to come with the idea to support the third parties, in this case being SMEs, for example, in boosting the tourism. So that we want uh, consortia to set the example for others to be followed. Uh, this is about the second pillar of the COSME program. Uh, I can briefly introduce you throughout uh, the other five pillars. Uh, I will try to squeeze that in a minute or two. That is the remaining time at my disposal. So we have the internal market. This is the, about making the internal market working even better. Here is, uh, there is um, uh, a special focus now, not only on goods and services, but on financial services, uh, anti-money laundering, free movement of capital, uh, and of course, uh, digital economy and public procurement. Uh, European standard, this is to the effective standard throughout the Europe. And this is also very important for the SMEs to be able to grow because it will help the uh, EU business to sell products and services across the EU. And not only, uh, you know, if your standard is, uh, if you reach a standard in your country, it will be easier for you to sell also in the other country because the standards are already met. Um, Consumer protection, uh, of course, this is uh, more on the down, downside uh, rather than uh, downstream rather than upstream. And this to ensure high level of consumer protection. Uh, both product safety, so this is important for the rules of the company and also to be able to voice the channel, the voice of the cons uh, consumers when they complain. Food safety, high level health for humans, animals, plants also <laughs> throughout the food chain. Uh, and last but not least, it's also to produce and disseminate high quality European statistics. This is also very important you know, because the decision making should be based on quality data uh, and also to evaluate the impact of initiatives. Uh, but also it's important to provide this data and statistics to the citizens to, in order to be able to have a high quality debate and a feedback. Uh, last but not least, of course, also this is of um, very important uh, research, uh, source um, help for the researchers. Uh, as I said, it's 4.2 million billion euros in, for the next seven years. Uh, here you have a little bit and the ch um, how it's distributed. Uh, this uh, budget. 
And of course, there we are building also key performance indicators and there will be a midterm evaluation how to do it. In the last part from my side, uh, the European Commission also set a new agency that is ASMEA, European Innovation Council and Small Medium Executive Agency. It's in a way successor of a uh, small medium enterprise a executive agency, uh, but it's more organized about the support to SMEs and within the important also contribution on the regional level, as we know that actually SMEs are very much embedded in their regional structure. Uh, this would uh, have been everything from my side. I think I've been a couple of minutes too long. Um, please, word to you yeah. if you have any questions. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Igor, for, uh, for uh, actually you were pretty pretty exactly on time uh, so in, in a good spirit with other speakers. So thank you for doing that. And thank you also for uh, putting into such a short time uh, in a kind of a period there is such an intense information and I would like to to ask a bit more about uh, Cosme Cosme follow-up uh, program as this is a topic which is most interesting to, to, to the participants in today's workshop and uh, my colleague Laurencio David was presenting uh, the future of Interreg saying that this is a an evolution and not a revolution and I guess this applies to to Cosme as well that it's 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 nothing revolutionary which is going to happen but 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 basically continuing uh, what has been uh, said before but but just is there some new elements or new uh, new priorities which were not there in in uh, in last period and and what would you like to bring on table uh, which, which is like a new uh, new uh, aspects in cosme uh, definitely i can tell you a little bit more about this Although the work program in Italy is being worked, uh, mm -hmm. so it's still not available. And of course, the work program, I mean, this is maybe the information for the larger uh, audience, is not done by us in the commission without, uh, in the, this uh, tower and uh, without, uh, I mean, just somebody that wakes up in the morning and decides that these are going to be the priorities. It's done, of course, in consultation with the member states and with all the interested groups, uh, uh, lobbying groups, of course, uh, uh, throughout uh, the European Union. So, uh, but to answer to your question, uh, one, it is, in line, it's not a revolution, it's an evolution of the COSME program, uh, but it's also an evolution in the way that I think that the tendency is to have maybe less calls, but more focused, um, and maybe bigger calls. So in, in this way, uh, it will be, uh, we will be able maybe to target the specific problems with a higher, with a major force, rather than having this uh, helicopter money uh, machine uh, distributing, maybe starting too many initiatives and not being able to conclude or to put, take them to the next level because actually the funds available are limited. So that's probably one of the uh, the, the newest element in a, in a, in this part. And then, of course, I, I suspect this is like me, Igor Kalinich, saying something, uh, thinking, because I haven't, I mean, we haven't finalized the work program, but I guess it will be in line with uh, what is um, the, the, let's say, the main themes that the, in every call somehow will recall the green and sustainable. So this is definitely as they use uh, industrial strategy and the strategy for SMEs, uh, that will be the, the common thing. Just to follow up uh, what, what you said, uh, that probably there will be less less calls and more focused, uh, just just to, uh, to, to, uh, to to try to clarify whether, whether we understand it uh, similarly. Does that mean that uh, the, the project sizes and, and project budget will, budgets will be then higher and there will be a, a smaller number of, uh, of total projects? And, and if, if this is yes, uh, just, just to uh, be a bit on provocative side, uh, do you see any risks that in that case uh, as a, as a smaller and let's say less less developed regions might have uh, a, a, a more difficult 
how to access actually those calls because those calls might be might be uh, uh, best suited for uh, leaders, innovation leaders, and, and cluster leaders, and, and leaving leaving aside uh, there's, a, there's a variety and, and diversity of European innovation ecosystems. Absolutely, very good questions, and unfortunately, I will have to be, <laughs> give a very diplomatic answer. Uh, first of all, uh, as I said, this is my impression at, at the moment because the work program hasn't been uh, finalized, so we don't know exactly how it is uh, going to be there. I can tell you what is uh, usually what we think. We really take care that uh, about the representation. So one of the key, I was very briefly talking about the key um, performance indicators, KPIs, and uh, for us it's of ultimate uh, importance that uh, in any program, all the regions, all the countries of the uh, of the union are represented. So this is absolutely something that we really take uh, care of. Uh, and uh, um, a general answer to the budget, to the questions regarding the budget, doesn't mean necessarily that if the budget is bigger for a single call or for a single action, that smaller um, let's say smaller players will be excluded because actually it's a consortia applying and actually it can be that at that point we will ask for consortia to be wider so they will be able also a lead partner will be able to integrate and get on board more partners um, so this is uh, not necessarily the case you know mm -hmm. actually it might be well the opposite if the call is small with the smaller with the um, restricted budget and we need us only for three or for uh, consortium members, then they will be just the main players there. Uh, but if the consortium is uh, wider, on the other case, of course, also I can say that uh, when the consortia are too wide, then there is the risk of uh, losing the focus sometimes. Mm -hmm. So there is always a fine balance. Uh, sure. Sure. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Igor, for clarifying this. I'm asking now everybody still in the audience that if you have any any questions to Igor, either in chat or or you can open your microphone and just uh, just ask it directly, if if any. Now it's your chance. If not, I cannot see anything in chat or anybody raising a hand in uh, in there. Uh, view mood in that case sir uh, i would like to thank you igor once again and uh, and uh, presenting uh, uh, an overview of what's happening uh, us in, uh, in in coming years and and of course good luck with finalizing uh, the, the, the call documents and preparing the first calls we are we are very much looking forward to 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 participate and and to to promote those calls in in our regions and and amongst the stakeholders and and of course uh, we are also looking forward that that this will will help European companies to scale up and and to become uh, innovation leaders in in the world and and globally as as this is after all one of our key targets why we are gathering here together today. But uh, having said that, uh, I would like now to also move to the concluding remarks of, of, of the session and, and uh, workshop today. Uh, I, I want to start by thanking all the presenters, uh, both in plenary sessions and also in our parallel sessions for, uh, for sharing your experiences and, and doing it in an inspiring way. We, we really appreciated your, uh, your time and the commitment to do it. And I, I do hope uh, very much that, that, that this was useful and, and something new for the participants. I also want to thank uh, the, our discussants uh, who, who helped us to, to summarize uh, parallel sessions. And, and of course, uh, most of all, I would like to thank the participants of, of today's uh, workshop. Uh, without participants and audience, there is, of course, no workshop, and, and we are very grateful. And as we said, if, if you still have questions to the speakers, please use the chat. 
or get into contact directly with us. Uh, so we will be happy to, to follow up uh, if, if anything still needs to be clarified or connected uh, with speakers. In terms of what is happening and now, I am closing this workshop in a minute. But uh, before doing it, I would like to kindly ask everybody who is still in, in our uh, online uh, uh, room to check the link on the chat, which was 